Uh, but I don't feel like that's where pe- where the real contention's coming in from people and the fact that monster the DM doesn't crit, only so players crit. That's that's the other side of it. I feel that like that adds a a threat level to the game. And I mean, even if you go ahead and put in these are the hard and fast crit rules for you know one D and D. I am pretty certain that there is going to be a large percentage of DMs out there who are like, nope, I still crit. I'm Nerdarchist Ted. And I'm Nerdarchist Dave. Welcome, Welcome to, to Nerdarchy. Nerdarchy. Four Nards, Five Nerds. Nerds. All right, so what are we talking about today, Dave? All right, so we're going to dive back into some 1D and D stuff. Uh, people are very angry and very opinionated about the crits, and, I'm, and I figured we would just combine the D20 tests as along with uh, crits as well. So if you'd be so kind to read the read them and then we'll discuss them. All right. So D20 test. The term D20 test encompasses the three main D20 roles of the game. Got ability checks, attack rolls, and saving throws. If something in the game affects D20 tests, it affects all three of these roles. The DM determines whether a D20 test is warranted in any given circumstance. To be warranted, a D20 test must have a target number no less than five and no greater than 30. Rolling, rolling a 1. If you roll a 1 on a D20 test, the D20 test automatically fails, regardless of any modifiers to the roll. If you roll a 20 on the D20, the D20 test automatically succeeds, regardless of any modifiers to the roll. A player character also gains inspiration when rolling the 20, thanks to the remarkable success. Rolling a 20 doesn't bypass limitations on the test, such as the range and line of sight. The 20 bypasses only bonuses and penalties to the roll. All right, so to me, automatically, this starts making me think of, well, what about all of the things like, you know, bless and, you know, uh, guidance or, you know, exhaustion? How are these things, like, going to be modified by these things? Because not all of those things that affect one currently could easily be kept as is and affect all of them going forward. I think it works fine. You don't have to change anything. I mean, they simplifies it because, you know, get a new player at the table, what do they always ask? What do I roll? It's a D20 test. All you have to say, D20 tests. And, I mean, generally before that, I'd be like, generally, if, you you know, when you got to roll something, just grab the D20. Most likely you're right. Um, You know, unless you're talking damage or something. But, you know, but, but initially it's a D20 roll. I like that. It simplifies it. Get a one, you fail. You get a twenty, you automatically succeed. None of your bonuses are going to matter for either of those. Um, there, there's been I see seen contention there a little bit because it's like, oh, then you can do impossible things and and you can do anything. All you have to do is roll a d twenty. But here's the caveat: players don't choose when to roll the d twenty. Mm-hmm. The dungeon master does. Right. And it even calls out certain things like if it's out of range of your longbow. You just can't hit it, Correct. right? So the D twenty doesn't matter there either. Uh, so so that so those things are really important. So I don't think it's a big deal. Um, previously or the way it is now, you could succeed on a skill check with a natural one as long as you beat the DC, right. beat the challenge number, and that so that's kind of a big that's kind of a big change. And also, um, you didn't automatically succeed on skill checks either. Maybe saving throws too, I think. It, it's hard to remember because there's so many versions of the game floating around in my head. But I think the only thing that was an automatic success was your attack rolls. I, I, to my recollection, it was attack rolls and saving throws automatically failed on a 1 and succeeded on a 20. And they're incorporating you know, the ability checks now into that particular role. And the other big change is we now get inspiration on a natural 20. I like that. Um, the because I feel like the current system nobody uses as uses it as the way it's presented. It was a good idea, but in practice, I don't think it is. It works very well. I, I find it personally a bit unwieldy because it's tied to a bunch of traits that each individual player character has, and then the GM has to know when those traits are being invoked. Uh, you know, otherwise, it's just going to get missed. So most of the time. In the games that I've played in, the player does something cool, and the DM's like, I like that, here's inspiration. Or they tell a funny funny joke, here's inspiration. Or whatever the thing is. Sure. Now it's codified to be like, okay, roll a 20, you're going to get inspiration. Also, I think you start with it when you have a long rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those things I'm I'm okay with. Uh, And I don't have a problem as much with... You know, once you look at it from a standpoint of the GM tells you whether or not 
you can roll the dice. I, I know that there has been, you know, for a long time of the bard seducing the queen mm -hmm. in the throne room in front of the king. And I think any any GM that decides, yeah, go ahead and roll, that's going to be absolutely wonky. And well, if they crit, they crit. Uh, but I would just be like, yeah, you can't roll. That's just not a possible thing. It's not It's not a DC 30 or 35. It's just no. You know, there's just too much decorum, you know. And unless, you know, the, the queen is totally down for that kind of stuff, but then sure, go ahead and roll it. Yeah, that, that's a different kind of game uh, altogether. But yeah, so, the, you know, that kind of simplifies that. It's easy. It's kind of codifies everything. I like it. You know, I, I, it's, and it's not really... It's not really that big of a change anyway. Yeah, I, I just think like uh, I'm I'm curious to see how they're going to put the staples in the game that people are using. Like I said, bless or you know guidance that affect you know anything because it says if if you have something that affects one of them, it affects all of them. So that that's the sentence that I'm I'm curious about is you know are there still going to have those kind of examples uh, or are they going to go away and we're going to have all new mechanics to learn and you know you're not going to get those d4 bonuses or you know the penalties to all of them you know right off the bat at exhaustion I I mean honestly the way it's just going to work is 2 through 19 you add the number 1 through 20 it doesn't matter all right so now let's move on to uh, to critical hits uh, weapons and unarmed strikes have a special feature for player characters critical hits if a player character rolls a 20 for an attack roll with a weapon or an unarmed strike, the attack is also a critical hit, which means it deals extra damage to the target. Roll the damage dice of the weapon or unarmed strike a second time and add the second roll as extra damage to the target. For example, a mace deals bludgeoning damage equal to 1d6 plus your strength modifier. If you score a critical hit with a mace, it instead deals 2 die 6 plus your strength modifier. If your weapon or unarmed strike has no damage dice, it deals no extra damage on a critical hit. So this is where we're going to get into a bit more controversial territory because it's calling out very specifically, these are the only things that can crit, and when you do crit, it only affects this specific die, your weapon die, your unarmed strike die. It doesn't affect your spells, your smite, your sneak attack. And, you know, we've tried experimenting in our own games with critical hits to make them better because nothing is as lame as getting a critical critical hit and rolling the minimum damage which could be less than you would have rolled just with a regular roll right so Correct. so our, we've experimented with like all right the first set of dice is maximized and then you roll on top of it so you're guaranteed to get maximum damage plus one right right um the problems that we ran into are paladins and rogues and casters to a, a minor degree, uh, and it really made you know things worse for the barbarian and the fighter uh, classes, Speci and as very much specifically the the fighter more than anybody. When you get to higher levels, at least the barbarian gets brutal critical. So you know you could you could benefit from that maybe, but right. it really helped other character classes much more than some other ones. So I kind of like, you know, only the weapon, right? It, it, so now it affects pretty much everyone evenly. Casters don't need any help. They're good. They're fine the way they are. Rogues already do a ton of damage and the same with paladins and their freaking smites. So I think, you know, to, to me, I've I've done some research on this, and I don't necessarily need you know more damage for the the rogue and the paladin, uh, but I do like the things that are affected, like you know oh you've got a, a burning weapon or a flaming weapon that does you know extra d sixes upon a hit, whether it be your your hex damage or whether it be your hunter's mark damage, all of these little things that do tend to add up a little bit. You know, but not to any staggering amounts. Uh, you know, over over the course of a game, I like those things, and I feel, you know, there is no easy way to be like, oh, well, what's you know, what's the general yeah. rule, uh, and it's either just weapon or not. Uh, you know, I, I feel like there's there's going to be something that's that's missing. Um, so like everybody else is getting nerfed, and the fighter is like, hey, welcome to my world. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, you know, like if you go with, you know, like if a fighter happens to have, you know, 
like I said, a flaming weapon, you know, those things would stack up. If they happen to be a battle master, those things tend to, you know, get added up as well. Um, you know, so like, I know that there's different components that fighters have used to be able to get extra damage, you know, on those things. And when they crit, it's like, you know, yay. Um, yeah, it, it does, it still affects them. It just affects them a lot less right. than, than some of the, some of these other classes. Uh, but I don't feel like that's where people, where the real contention's coming in from people and the fact that monster, the DM doesn't crit, only so players crit. That's, that's the other side of it. I feel that like, that adds a, a threat level to the game. And I mean, even if you go ahead and put in, these are the hard and fast crit rules for, you know, one D&D, I am pretty certain that there is gonna be a large percentage of DMs out there who are like, nope, I still crit. And, you know, oh, well, the, the adamantine armor becomes a homebrew magic item because it, it'd be useless for, uh, like, oh, well, I put my monster in it and, well, you now can't crit me, and well, I guess I can't crit you either, so <laughs> haha, fair is fair. And then, oh, you get the magic item, and it's not really a magic item anymore because it's just a thing that is useless to you because it's, you know, it's a mechanic that I don't use. Or if I do use it, well then, okay, you know, yay, kudos to you. I can't crit that character, but I'm gonna crit everybody else. Yeah, that, that, that uh, I didn't even think about the Amantium armor, which I have in one of your games. Mm -hmm. And you crit it on me like three times in one combat. Well, to be, to be fair, you, you are attacking recklessly, so I'm getting advantage <laughs> on every single attack against you, and you are the, the aggro, so like yeah. things are attacking you more often. So it's a lot of dice. It is a lot of dice. Yeah, so, so there is that, and Mantium will not be as special. As, now, I, I have like, I don't know how I feel about it yet because one one thing's a, one thing for sure from a design standpoint, it is a lot easier to design and create things without the wild card of of a crit in there because uh, one through third level, maybe fourth level, depending on what kind of monsters you're using, what character classes you're talking about, a crit could be a game ender, right? Yeah, for, sure. for low level characters, mm -hmm. and maybe they don't want to scare off new players with like. Oh, you know, they, their first combat, you know, the monster goes first and rolls a nat 20 and just destroy, obliterates their, their, their character in one go. It was just like an orc or whatever. But they're not even down. They're just dead, right? right. Uh -huh. It's happened in our games, you it know. Has. <laughs> um, so, so there might be a little bit of that. But they, I also heard that they're talking about, like, doing things that are more interesting with crits. I'm intrigued by that. Like, if their ability, monster abilities were to recharge on a nat 20, or if some other special thing were to happen from getting, you know, getting the nat 20, that might be cool if they explore that direction. But yeah, I don't think, I don't think the survey that is that coming back in for one D&D &D based off of, nope, we're not doing that anymore are going to be good. The, you know, the DMs are going to be, there's going to be an outcry of DMs. And to a certain extent, I think some players like it that it's more dangerous mm -hmm. as well. Of course. Um, and I, and I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure what is motivating them to put it in there. It's still play test. Uh, you know, they're testing the waters, uh, but I don't know what they're looking for. So I, I would say like, and this is, this is going to sound very, very video gamey, but I, I feel if you're going to, talk about a rule set, optional rules are always a thing. Literally, the, the player's handbook discusses feats as an optional thing, uh, so... Not anymore. Well, not anymore, <laughs> I, underst I understand that, and that's a whole other thing. Uh, that's but, a different video. But if you if you approach this kind of aspect from a, you know, where do we want to set the hard mode, like, easy would be DMs can't crit, DMs don't automatically succeed on, you know, any kind of, like, natural 20 kind of things, um, you know, I feel like people would argue, though, we're already playing D&D &D in our easy mode compared to previous editions. Sure, and I get that, but, like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divulge for just a moment. Like, I run a different style of game than, you know, a lot of other people that I talk to. Just came back from D&D &D in a castle, and we're talking about, you know, so at every meal, like, oh, what happened in the last session kind of thing. And I've got, you know, oh, these players, yeah, first session, first combat, you know, the, you know this player got, you know, a Vorpal sword used against them, head cut off and what have you. And I'm like, 
dear God, who uses a Vorpal sword on somebody in their very first combat of like a thing like D and D in a castle? Holy crap! You know, and then throughout the whole thing, like you know, oh, more death here, more death there, and I'm like, wait a minute, who's the Vorpal sword? Uh, B. Dave Walters. I suspected as much. <laughs> he likes running like really high level games. Yeah, it was too. a twentieth level game. There were like you know gods and stuff that was all all being part yeah. part and parcel. Players all all had a great time. B. Dave is amazing. Uh, had a lot of lot of fun, you know, meeting and chatting with him. But that's not a style of game that I ever want to play. I am never looking to be like, yep, I'm gonna cut this dude's head off. <laughs> you know, so I tend to run like through the course of a game, you know, a varied level of things, and every so often, I'll punch, I'll punch hard, but never like a Vorpal level, you know, hard. Uh, but it, it's something like. You can run a, a variety of levels of, of lethality, and you can take fifth edition and dial it back so that it's, you know, designed to get more into the story and exploration and RP and combat is is there to kind of fill in the gaps and give them something to fight against. But it's not designed to literally, you know, kill the adventurers. It's meant to challenge them, and that's where I feel. I, I provide an, an amazing time. And, you know, so be it. To those who like that style, great. But you can dial that up and you can kind of go along the lines of what I would call like where Matt Mercer tends to tends to run. Based off of my observation, he's not on the player's side. He's there to prevent a challenge and he argues in favor of, you know, what's going to do the most damage you know, in that instance to the players. Uh, and there's times that he loses those arguments or, you know, what have you, but he's there to provide a serious level of threat, but he's not out for blood. He's not looking to be like, who can I kill this session? Uh, and then you've got, you know, that third tier of look out for blood. I'm going to make this as hard as possible. And I am legitimately against you guys. Good luck. And, you know, that's where, you know, purple swords kind of, kind of come in. So like you can play fifth edition in any of those kind of iterations or any kind of varying levels in between. So it is possible to kind of have a toggle. And if you put in an optional rule of here's how to approach combat from these kind of standpoints, you know, it could be just a couple of pages of extra optional ways to play the game. But I think it would go well to educating DMs out there and be able to allow them to choose the kind of rule set that fits them and their table accordingly. See, I, I kind of disagree a little bit, sure. I, which I won't get too deeply into this video because that's all. I think it's another topic. It might be another sure. video we do. Let us know if you want us to talk about this. I actually think hard D and D uh, facilitates more problem solving and role playing than easy D and D sure. does uh, when it comes to combat. Sure. So, where do you fall on the crit hits? I'm I'm up in the air. There's some, some things that I like and some things that I don't. I see your points about rogues and paladins not needing the help, and if they're nerfed, then it would make sense that you have to nerf everything else. But I do feel like those extra little things, you know, those simple little. I'm just gonna add a d6 here, add a d6 there. I I, I feel like they're they're at a loss, and I I I, I feel that that's sad. But you can't. Add them and not add everything else. I so. would I would rather just have weapons, maybe magic weapons, that have special properties on on, on a crit. crit. Sure. That, and, and you know, so it's like designed into the game specifically. I have no. You're mm. never going to see me arguing against nerfing the rogue because the rogue is so good in five e. Sure. Compared to other classes. Uh, same with Paladin. Like, they're the two uber classes, I would especially agree. when it comes to Marshals. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing better is a high-level wizard than, like, you know, high-level casters just blow everything away. Sure. Uh, except for the Warlock. They they can't keep you with the other high-level casters. Uh, I would agree there as well. But, you know, they're fun and special in their own way. Indeed. Uh, so I'm, I'm completely okay with that. I like the idea of, you know, every other martial class not outshining the fighter all the time. Mm. Um, and because, like, the fighter tends to not get as many cool special abilities that they can use often, as often because they get consistent things, right? right? Like, they're probably, they get more attacks, so they're probably going to crit more often. Um, and so that that's kind of, like, their special thing. 
uh, where the Paladins don't need to crit more often because they're just like, smite, there's 70 points of damage, and I was without a crit, you know? So <laughs> Yeah, it is, it is, it is tough comparing. Uh, you know, Paladin does have, you know, a limited number of spell slots that they get access to, but literally the Rogue is not in any way, shape, or form a resource-driven, you know, class. It every can, round. It can do everything that it can do as long as it meets certain criteria, and if you're playing a rogue well, you're going to meet that criteria all the time. It's like, oh, I have something I can do with my bonus action all the time. I've got, you know, I've got the ability to try to set up a, a, a sneak attack every single time. You You've got so many different ways that you can finagle the rogue that yeah it does not need the help it is awesome it is great and if you're really an optimizer there are ways for you to even start getting sneak attacks on your reactions mm -hmm. as well so it's even more and the, i think one of the most damage done by a martial character from what in our games was from a rogue when we implemented our 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 uh, homebrew rules for crits, and we went, oh, this isn't going to work. Because it was like 111 or 116 points of damage mm -hmm. from one shot. Yep. Like, it was more than power word kill. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, it was, it was crazy. And, you know, it, it makes you kind of rethink, you know, how you're doing kind of things. So... You know, it's it's up to you as to what you want to do with your table. Uh, I, I would rather err on the side of what they're doing, but I feel if you're going to take away, you know, the ability to crit from a from a DM, that there's got to be something else that goes along with it. You know, attached to a monster stat block, and I'm eager to see what kind of things you're going to go there. But I feel like a toggle switch, uh, you know, would be something that yeah. you know could be done, or you know, certain monsters have the ability to crit and that's worked into into their challenge like there's so many different directions that could be done uh and and approached from a mechanical standpoint you know is the way to go yeah i like that d uh d20 tests uh I'm really happy with that i think all of that looks really good i think the things i've seen people complain about are non-issues you know, it, you know, the biggest thing is you're just letting your players dictate to when the D20 gets rolled. That's not how it works. They tell you what you want to, they want to do. And then as a DM, you determine what is necessary. It might be a no roll. It might be impossible. It might be, uh, give me this check. Uh, when it comes to crits, I'm pretty much wait and see. I see, uh, you know, leveling the playing field. Totally cool with that. But I also see an opportunity to do things that are more interesting. Like if the DM, like maybe the, the DM doesn't do extra damage. Maybe it's a push. Maybe it's a a knock prone it's a disarm it's like these cool complications that can come up that don't don't necessarily automatically mean the character's going to die but uh they might get more hurt like if a monster gets a bunch of attacks and it knocks them prone with the first one and then gets a bunch more attacks right yeah. at, at advantage or whatever you know whatever the new, new rule will be for a prone prone character in one D, &D uh monster abilities recharging on a nat 20 would be pretty friggin' cool as well. And, you know, if they come up with other things. So we'll yeah. see what happens. Plenty of directions to go. Uh, you know, just, you know, take away. This is all play test and things are kind of up in the air. So if you don't like something, fill out that survey. Uh, if you do like something, fill out that survey too so that they know what your thoughts and opinions are. But hey, you like these videos, others like it, as well as all the great content over on nerdarchy.com. Why not come check us out on Patreon and support us over there? Articles like top five things I wish for one d, &D. If you're looking for another way to help support Nerdarchy, why not come check out Nerdarchy the Store and pick up the Seizing the Means PDF. In Seizing the Means, characters traveling through the wilderness discover an unusual kobold culture. Fed up with being put down by the majority of entities in the multiverse, these creative kobolds have discovered a new way to steer course of their own destiny and evolution. This special encounter was created as a free preview for out-of-the-box encounters for 5th edition. Designed in the same style as all 55 gorgeously illustrated encounters in the book from our wildly successful crowdfunding campaign, Seizing the Means is ready to drop right into your games. With new monsters, a new skill challenge, and engaging story elements, this easy-to-use scenario will energize your gaming session. Let us know down below what you think of the 1 D&D playtest so far, the D20 test, the crits, love it, hate it. How would you do it? We can discuss it down in the comments. While you're down there, don't forget to do all those things that make Nerdarchy and YouTube happy. Like, share, subscribe. Go ahead and click on that notification bell so you don't miss a single video. Quick reminder, we drop new videos here on the channel Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, so come on back, but you can't wait till then. Don't worry, we got you covered. One D&D Playtest live chat up here. So until next time, stay nerdy. nerdy.